Americans, this is Paul Harvey. Stand by for news. He was the most honored broadcaster of our times. For so many Americans, no morning, Monday through Saturday, is quite complete without Paul Harvey news and time. He was awarded the Medal of Freedom and the attention of millions of Americans. Larry Stone in the West Kentucky News says he awakened to be greeted by this cold, miserable day, and he prayed that the Lord would send him enough strength to get up and get dressed and run 10 miles and go to work. But he says the Lord sent him wisdom instead, and he rolled over and went back to sleep. Near Cassville, Arkansas, there is a Watusi cow with the largest horn. As a boy, I fell in love with words and ran away from home and joined the radio. It really was something. He was married to one woman almost long enough to earn a mention on his own program. None of the scholars, none of the military brass, none of the intellectual giants has ever humbled me to the degree that has my dear wife of more years than she will let me recite. In this hour, we salute Paul Harvey and American life. I'm Gil Gross. Now you know that Paul Harvey has passed away. He had taken very good care of himself all of his life. Rest assured, he used those medications and supplements he told you about. But in the end, even the best-maintained body breaks down, the fire flickers, the eyes close, and we go to meet our maker. Paul Harvey would want you to know that he left the world confident that he was going to a better place, sure in the faith that sustained him all of his life. For the next hour, we're going to celebrate that life, a life that reached the highest pinnacles of fame. Those of us who flit about the fickle, flirtatious flame of fame pretend to many motives, but make no mistake. We do enjoy the dance. The trick, of course, is to be warmed by those flames without being consumed by them. I'm glad he pronounced that. But he was always grounded in that most American of ideals, love for home and family. My wonder-filled adventure in journalism began figuratively sitting at the feet of an Emporia, Kansas editor I never met, William Allen White of the Emporia Gazette. It was he almost alone who brought middle America to the attention of the world. Nobody better than Mr. White ever reduced the world's complexities to shirt sleeve English that anybody could comprehend. My professional ambition was and still is to serve his constituency. During the hour, we'll be reminded of how Paul Harvey thought about the basics of life by revisiting portions of some of his broadcasts and some of his public speeches, including remarks he made in 2003 when he was given a light award by his many friends in the radio industry. One of the reasons Paul Harvey was admired by radio people was that he admired them and what they did and what they do. Radio people in their preoccupied haste have been letting go sometimes of the might and majesty of spoken word. Then go is pleasing I, but Shakespeare is fathomless. Special effects for all of their sophistication are still not as effective as human imagination. Fourth and fifth graders survey say that after seeing a Harry Potter movie, when they try to reread a Harry Potter book, their imagination is constricted, limited by what they have seen. Quidditch was much more fun in our mind's eye. So distinct is the disparity that the publisher of the books will use no scenes from the movies on the covers of those books. You trust me to paint... You trust me to paint pictures on the mirror of your mind and I will let you feel such agony and ecstasy, such misery and such magnificence as you would never be able to feel by looking at it. Let me paint you a, a picture of unrequited love in 17 words. When the fire in me meets with the ice in you, what could remain but damp ashes? Now you tell me what picture in all of film could you duplicate that pregnancy, that, that poignancy. We court with the lights turned down. It's to remain undistracted. We savor a fragrance or a kiss or a foot massage with our eyes closed. No one in the radio business ever put words together better than Paul Harvey. Put words together or kept words apart. 
if there was anything as legendary as his writing, it was the pauses between words. The pauses are sometimes because I'm overwhelmed in a search for words. My AC colleagues have often threatened to save up all this in the Paul Harvey News broadcast. <laughs> sells more spot announcements in there. Paul Harvey once said his job was to make what's important interesting, and what's interesting, important. That's why you'd sometimes hear a story about an international crisis. Good morning, Americans. Operation Iraqi Freedom is underway. Our first bombs and missiles were aimed at taking out Saddam Hussein personally. Apparently, they did not. Shortly thereafter, he was on Baghdad TV in uniform, vowing revenge and quoting from the Koran. Part of our early strategy is to test Saddam Hussein's resolve to use chemical weapons. Not yet. Followed by a quintessential piece of Americana. Near Cassville, Arkansas, there is a Watusi cow with the largest horns that anybody has ever seen. Or this, for what it's worth. Oh, uh, for what it's worth, department, here's from Shelbyville, Delaware, where police say John White, 35, robbed this bank yesterday and fled. Police followed, trailed him to an outhouse south of town. They surrounded the outhouse, told him to come out with his pants up. Police report says they transferred him in handcuffs from one can to the other. Paul Harvey, good day. Paul Harvey had very strong opinions about today's broadcast news. My own network, ABC, once tried broadcasting a program of just good news. You know how long that lasted? 13 weeks. Not enough listeners wanted to listen to just good news. In Sacramento, California, a little tabloid called itself the good newspaper. Printed just good news. Lasted 36 months before it went bankrupt. As far as I've been able to ascertain, there's only one newspaper in the USA today printing just good news. It's a little tabloid. Comes out once a week in Indiana, and they have to give it away. Because that good news that y'all keep saying you want, you just won't buy and that's why you can listen to any broadcast and records are crashing and it's the worst wind and the worst flood or fire or earthquake or whatever because noise makes news and sex and noise and sin make news and one gunshot makes more noise than a thousand prayers. But he often called himself a sunny Midwestern optimist, and he always preferred to stress the positive. He well remembered the Great Depression when he started his radio career, not only by speaking on the microphone, but by sweeping up the floor under that microphone after the station signed off for the day. So he believed if you worked hard and lived within your means, everything would work out in the end. Long-time listeners well know whenever Paul Harvey reported a particularly depressing economic statistic, he'd always turn it around, show the positive side. He remembered when the national unemployment number was upwards of 20%, so hard economic times to him were a relative thing. The headline says employment, or no, 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 the headline will never say that. The headline says unemployment, 6.1%. Have you ever wondered why they always headline unemployment? They do. Why doesn't the headline say employment, 93.9%? Paul Harvey loved to include Americana in his newscast. When he said, good morning, American, he meant it. His broadcasts were intended for Americans. Who else would care about a story like Larry Stone in the West Kentucky News? Says he awakened to be greeted by this cold, miserable day. And he prayed that the Lord would send him enough strength to get up and get dressed and run 10 miles and go to work. But he says the Lord sent him wisdom instead, and he rolled over and went back to sleep. Paul Harvey, good day. And Paul Harvey cared about America. A few years ago, he recalled for CNN's Larry King the broadcast that may have been his most famous, the broadcast when he urged President Nixon to bring the troops home from Vietnam. I had always been reared with the old MacArthur feeling that the only excuse for getting into a war is to win it. The only justification for war is to win it. And then one day I realized that in spite of the expenditure of all of our gold and all of that blood in Vietnam and in Korea, the most 
we were able to deliver was a stalemate on the 50-yard line. We'd paid much too high a price for that. And it was then that I suggested that, that drive it or park it. It's been widely reported, although we can't prove it, that shortly after Paul Harvey said that, President Nixon began the process that led to the withdrawal of American forces and the fall of Saigon. We continue our memorial tribute to the late Paul Harvey with a look at the best radio salesman of his generation after these words. My goodness, so frequently some of the best news that's included in my broadcast is within the body of the commercial. When it if you're just joining us, we're reviewing the life of our friend Paul Harvey, who's passed away. Long-time Paul Harvey listeners know that for many years, the broadcast was sponsored by Banker's Life and Casualty Company, which was headed by John MacArthur. What you probably don't know is that when John and Catherine MacArthur died and left a large sum of money to the foundation that bears their name, Paul Harvey was named to the foundation's board of directors. For many years, Paul Harvey was among those who determined who would receive the MacArthur Foundation's famous genius grants. And of course, he tied his foundation work to his life's work. I'm on a foundation board, the MacArthur Foundation, which is large sums for research. And I can tell you that a lot of scholars and a lot of institutions secure money for research by producing bad news about population, about resources, about environment. For another thing, there's a demonstrable fascination with. There's a proof public preference for bad news because what's bad news to somebody is good news. To many, the listener or the reader of bad news can say to himself, well, at least I'm not as bad or as bad off as those fellows. And then the printer whose printing machine broke down or the builder who bid too low or the salesman who lost a sale or the farmer who lost a crop or the wildcatter who drilled a duster, he can see his problem is not so bad after all. After all, bad news is good news. The reader does not want to read about some rich man who's healthy and happily married. That might tend to make the reader feel sorry for himself. But if the rich man is divorced or diseased or loses his money, that's more interesting reading. Because then the reader can feel himself to be better off. There's always somebody in any hospital ward just enough worse off to help us feel comparatively fortunate. And noisy news serves that purpose. And thus the plane crash, which does not involve you, the billionaire in bankruptcy, the charity boss caught stealing, the movie actor charged with murder, these will continue to be on page one for as long as the fire which burns them warms the rest of us. Yes, Paul Harvey was extraordinarily close to his advertisers. The people who, in his words, put their money where his mouth is. You couldn't just walk into the office, plunk down some money, and have Paul Harvey read your ad. First, you had to meet with Paul Harvey and have him try your product. Only if you passed those tests would your message get on the air. And Paul Harvey wouldn't just read your commercial, he'd write it, make it personal. Paul Harvey believed that his advertising conveyed useful information to listeners, just as his newscast did. And he was every bit as enthusiastic about the commercials as about the news items. He took his ocular nutrition every day. I have a letter today from Herb Anhall to Blake Forest, Illinois, who has used glucosamine, chondroitin, and MSM formula for years and says the arthritis in my knees had been so bad I could hardly walk. It was almost impossible to stand. I heard you talking about high health ultimate glucosamine, and I've been using your ocular nutrition for and years. And the Harveys really did have a sleep number bed. We just wanted to tell you how much we love our sleep number bed. Huh? This is a love letter I got over the Internet from Ann and Vince in Belleville, Illinois. Every night I tell my husband I really love our new mattress. I don't think a night goes by without him saying the same thing. He loves our mattress. An ad on the Paul Harvey Show was one of the highest-priced commercials in the radio business, which is amazing because 
Paul Harvey ads contain no jingles, no electronic effects, no hyperventilating pitchman. Just Paul Harvey's voice. And that voice moved the goods because it was trusted by millions of people across the nation. Advertisers in the United States are going to spend $249.3 billion this year. And by the way, that's 5% more than last year. Telling us all of the good things, real and imagined, about their respective products. Isn't it a rotten shame that with noisy, distressing, depressing news hour after hour, day in and day out, by our own emphasis on all of the bad things, crime and inflation and pollution and floods and fires and discords and disaster and discontent, by our persistent preoccupation with negatives, we tend to unsell ourselves and our impressionable offspring on a way of life which is the envy of the rest of the world. Once, Paul Harvey talked about the importance and the value of advertising. My goodness, so frequently some of the best news that's included in my broadcast is within the body of the commercial. <laughs> that there really is now a, a response for such and such an illness. That there really is a better way to do this or to do that. That there really is a wonderful way to extend human life and alleviate pain. But if you think he was simply providing information in his commercials... Think again. Paul Harvey took great pride in the fact he could move the merchandise. I am a salesman, and I say that with pride. You compare occupations to sports, and I think selling is most like football. Commission selling of a quality product, that's pro football in the big leagues. Selling is a profession which combines all of the psychology of a defensive quarterback with the calculated risk of slam-bang, head-on, hit-the-line, body-contact competition. No profession more than this one demands that a man pick himself up and dust himself off and keep on keeping on. And few rewards are more thrilling than a signed dotted line. One insurance company I know discovered that we can put one sale in the community and he may starve. We can put three salesmen in that one community and they'll all get rich. The greatest adventure stories in the literature of commerce are the Horatio Alger stories of men who learned overcoming resistance with persistence by selling. Billy Graham once was a fuller brush man. William Wrigley peddled products door to door, and others who got their first training in patience and perseverance by selling face to face were Abraham Lincoln and Gary Cooper and George Peabody and Arthur Godfrey. To me, there's no more inspiring story in American literature than the story of James Cash Penny. At an age when most men expect to retire, Mr. Penny started over. And he was flat broke and seven million dollars in debt. He was a frail, nervous, physical wreck. He was committed to a sanitarium, and yet his fortune gone, his health broke. Jim Penny at 56 began a comeback until healthy, happy, and at 90, he headed a vast empire of almost 2,000 J.C. Penny stores. And Horatio Alger still lives you don't learn selling in school, but when you learn to sell yourself and your product, the horizon is limitless. Half of all of the presidents of America's top 500 corporations came up through sales and or marketing, but football and selling takes guts. The other guy doesn't get out of your way. He purposely does everything he can to get in your way. And for most of us, there is no guaranteed security or protracted paid vacations, no promise of early retirement, but who'd want to retire from a vocation that's more fun than any avocation could be? I am a salesman, and until the day they nail the lid on that box, I will be. And until that day, my primary focus will be keeping our God-blessed United States of America <laughs> sold on itself. Paul Harvey has passed away after a long life as a broadcaster, commentator, family man, and friend. We'll take a look at a few of the forces that made Paul Harvey after these words. As a boy, I fell in love with words and 
ran away from home and joined the radio. It really was something. Oh, Jenny. Paul Harvey was very much a product of where he lived and where he died. The American heartland. Where most major media people saw flyover country, Paul Harvey saw real America. The place where people got married and stayed married, built careers, and raised children who graduated from high school and aspired to college. He was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and was educated there, the son of a policeman who was killed in the line of duty. In Paul Harvey's career, there were many WKRPs between Tulsa, Oklahoma, and now. My first tentative steps away from home were to Kansas. A Dr. Brinkley had used his radio station in Abilene to sell young goat glands to old men. And he was evicted from the United States. He fled to Mexico. And his station with studios in Abilene and Salina and Milford was bought by Farmers and Bankers Life Insurance Company, redesignated KFBI, Farmers Bankers Life Insurance. The negotiation moved the station to the company's home base, Wichita, or wanted to, but the FCC was not going to let them make that move. They had to demonstrate that the station couldn't otherwise survive out there in the plains of Kansas. So what they did was to hire the least experienced teenage applicant they could possibly find <laughs> to help them lose money. And that was me. And when I made the station profitable, I, 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 I became disposable, but not before I had become a flag-waving Kansan. In St. Louis, he met Lynn Cooper, and he always said proposed to her on their first date. Lynn became his wife, his producer, and his angel. I married an angel. Be sure you understand that's not a figure of speech. I married an angel. <laughs> and nobody else will ever be so important to me. I have met all of the presidents of the United States and since FDR. I was perhaps among public figures most impressed with Sir Winston Churchill because he and I shared a passionate love for our beautiful language but none of the scholars, none of the military brass, none of the intellectual giants humbled me to the degree that has my dear wife of more years than she will let me recite. The young couple moved to Chicago, where Paul Harvey News quickly became the most popular radio newscast. In 1951, Leonard Goldenson, who would go on to become CEO of ABC, hired Harvey for his fledgling ABC radio network. But the move to the network did not mean a move to New York or the newer media capital of Los Angeles. Nowhere else could I benefit from the wide-angle perspective which this hub of the wheel makes possible. Not from New York, not from Los Angeles. Not from Washington, D.C. Paul and Angel Harvey lived in the Chicago area for the rest of their 68-year marriage until she died of leukemia well into her 90s. Now, in the early part of his career, Paul Harvey was a street reporter assigned to cover the world's hot spots, which gave him an unusual perspective on today's world crises. My time in the Middle East was limited as a correspondent, but I was there long enough over a span of years to learn one significant, very significant thing about the several nations of that area. And that one significant thing is that most don't want peace. This is very difficult for us to understand. The Western mind just can't comprehend any peoples who don't want peace. As our ambition motivates us to improve ourselves and our lot, 
Their motivation is to die for a holy cause. It's incomprehensible for us. A worst-case scenario is that we will leave our objective unrealized and come home. But we have learned in Vietnam that we can lose a fight ignominiously, and if we are a healthy people in a healthy nation, we can pick ourselves up again and again and again. From the place he called his skyscraper studio, overlooking what the Chicago City Council named Paul Harvey Drive, Paul Harvey told stories about America and Americans, the great and the small. He arrived at 4 a.m., always dressed in a suit, the jacket of which he would immediately hang up and replace with a smock, the better to keep the ink off his clothes. He'd go through the morning's news, print it out for him on a pair of teletype machines, picking out the stories that he thought might be of interest. And then he'd sit at his typewriter, oh yeah, typewriter, and write his take on what he read. When confronted with the possibility of writing on a computer, his stock reply was always, I keep thinking they'll go away. Until recently, he preferred to do his program live, so that if a story broke while it was on the air, his listeners would be the first to hear it. What was news for Paul Harvey? Here's a sample. Plane crashed into the side of the World Trade Center, exploding on impact. Minutes later, another plane crashed into the second tower and exploded. Subsequently, both towers collapsed. We were next to hear from the Pentagon that it had been hit. Suddenly, we were in an undeclared war with enemies that are already dead. Speculation is inevitable. It's very difficult to guard against an enemy whose religion teaches him die for his convictions is a shortcut to heaven. A man in Vietnam had lost all of his teeth by the time he was 90. He is now 95 and teething again. He has a dozen new ones already. In the spotlight, Barry Bonds. Three home runs in one game last night at Coors Field. The giant slugger is closing in on Mark McGuire's record 70 in one season. Boomer Knott is one big boy. Carl Boomer Knott, a student at Hartford, Vermont High School. He is 6'7", and he weighs 405 pounds. Of course they want him to play football, but so far they can't find a size 9 helmet in front of the 6th Presbyterian Church at 16th Street Northwest. The sign says, don't trust to luck. Remember, the rabbit's foot didn't work for the rabbit. Paul Harvey has often been described correctly as conservative, but his idea of conservative wasn't always in line with what 21st century conservative politicians believe. Self-government without self-discipline is everywhere falling apart. It's been, what, a dozen years since communism collapsed in Eastern Europe. Those nations are free at last. But freedom implies responsibility, and most were not prepared for that. So what? Yugoslavia is in chaos. Bosnia is on board. Albania is mired in economic chaos. Bulgaria, Hungary, Lithuania found freedom too difficult. They've already reverted to caretaker communist governments. The Russian people, free, free at last, out from under communism and free. But freedom implies responsibility, and the Russians were certainly not ready for that. So crime in Moscow is pandemic, the economy is struggling, and the Kremlin's up for grabs. Well, self-government won't work here either without self-discipline. The UN Secretary General Kofi Annan is a native of Ghana, a native of Ghana, Africa. Yet recently, he looked at the tribal wars going on out in the Sierra Leone and the Congo, the Central African Republic, Angola, Ethiopia, Eritrea, and he said, and this is a quote, I don't think we have a chance of moving on to economic and social development. Self-government won't work without self-discipline. Paul Harvey is gone now, but in life he may have been the most honored broadcaster ever. Well, look at that after these words. You can't not, you can't not listen to Paul Harvey when it's good day. 
flags flew on the radio towers of America's radio stations today, they would be at half staff. Radio Hall of Fame Museum President Bruce Dumont talking about ABC's Paul Harvey, who died on Saturday at a hospital in Phoenix, surrounded by his family. You trust me to paint pictures on the mirror of your mind, and I will let you feel such agony and ecstasy as you would not. How influential was Paul Harvey as a newscaster? Here's one measure. Even in these days, when radio newscasts are no more than two minutes long, Paul Harvey's five-minute and 15-minute shows were invariably the top-rated news programs on network radio. Paul Harvey's office walls were decorated with the awards that he received, keys to cities, large and small, honorary college degrees, autographed pictures from presidents. Among his most recent accolades, he always pronounced that word, accolades, was presented to him at the White House in 2005. For so many Americans, no morning Monday through Saturday is quite complete without Paul Harvey's news and comment. He was also a member of the Radio Hall of Fame and the recipient of countless professional honors. Before he went to Washington to be honored by President George W. Bush, he admitted it was a significant event in his life. By now you've heard that Paul Harvey, next week at the White House, is to receive our nation's highest civilian award the Presidential Medal of Freedom. So if I'm away from this microphone one day next week, you will know where I am. This is the highest honor that I have received since 60-some years ago when Angel said, I do. Page three. And his listeners included not just John and Martha Smith and Small Town America, they included people we've all heard of. I was listening to Paul Harvey a couple of weeks ago. You listen to Paul Harvey? I'm telling you, you can't, you can't not listen to Paul Harvey when it's good day. Or oh, he's been doing that news show for so long. His first scoop was the writing of the Ten Commandments. One of the most distinctive voices in all of radio. The way Paul told stories, you know. Uh, and I, I wouldn't even begin, I wish I could, uh, I imitate his voice. A very distinct, one of the great radio voices of all time. But even as he hobnobbed with the rich and famous, Paul Harvey never forgot where he came from. He talked about his roots some years ago as he gave the Alf Landon lecture. Oh, he knew Alf Landon, by the way, at Kansas State University. Traveling to Kansas Corners with the Norse Gospel Trio from our radio station to many Mennonite churches in the state. I learned to love God and country and Kansas before you were born. I was born again in Kansas years later in... Paul Harvey's life is over, and we're paying tribute to him and his many accomplishments. But he himself never looked back. Rather, he always looked to the future. We'll share that vision after these words. In the lab, we will slow the speed of light to faster than a man can walk. Paul Harvey once told a friend that he continued to go to work in the morning, well past the age when most of us would be retired, because if he didn't, he wouldn't know what to do with himself when he woke up. And when he did wake up every day, he believed that something good would happen before that day ended. And that tomorrow would be better than today. And if you ever thought that Paul Harvey was a creature of the past, think again. As you listen to his vision of the future. Again, taken from his Landon lecture at Kansas State University. And as you listen to his favorite piece of American music, George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. What will the next millennium be like? A year-round fabric for clothing, temperature controlled by a battery in your pocket. A fabric for furniture that does the same thing indoors. We will manipulate the time-space continuum. We will travel in time, backward or forward. In the lab, we will slow the speed of light to no faster than a man can walk. In the firmament, we will explore our universe and beyond at collapsed time. The first years of the new century will add whole pages to Webster's Dictionary as we continue to dream and to do. We're going to harness the limitless energy of the wind for three pennies per kilowatt hour. And then cold diffusion will catapult power into a whole new dimension. We're going to learn the language of animals and what a difference that will make 
in our human behavior toward them. We will propel vehicles for a year on a thimble full of fuel. And if we are very, very bright, we might even make vehicle bumpers the same height. <laughs> Medical science will evolve from curing disease to preventing it. As the last half of the century taught us how chemistry creates the electricity which operates each humanoid, the next half century will teach us how to regulate it for enhanced efficiency. Now we know the brain thinks, tomorrow we'll learn how. Einstein revealed that energy is equivalent to mass or matter. In a womb in this room may be the Einstein who will reveal that empty space is not empty at all. If you have uncontrolled type 1 diabetes, there is ongoing research right now which involves transplanting healthy insulin-producing islet cells by infusion. <laughs> it is accomplished with a needle through the skin. There's now a variable treatment for Alzheimer's. Is it viable? Well, our government is conducting multiple studies of the drug memantine for people with moderate to severe Alzheimer's. And in one of the studies, at least, memantine does slow down memory loss and physical decline. Combined with another drug, it actually has improved memory and thinking skills. Paul Harvey is gone now, which means that some things will change and some things will stay the same. Here at ABC, we'll continue to offer news and comment programs in the morning and at noon, but they won't include Paul Harvey's catchphrases. The rest of the story will continue, delivered by Paul Harvey Jr., who always wrote those popular features. But to those of us who are his friends, we'll have to live with the memories of an early morning at the office, a cheery greeting over a cup of coffee, the echo of a voice that has now been stilled. Paul Harvey's passing certainly brings an era to an end. We can only be grateful that we lived through at least a part of that era, and that Paul Harvey's vision of a better and brighter America comes true. For now, I'll sign off. For myself and Sue Chamberlain, who put this tribute together, I'm Gil Gross, ABC News. And I'll leave the final sign-off to the man in Chicago. Paul Harvey. Good day. When...